that feeling of you, you really have to be an idiot. Uh, the next feeling, if you are uh, an antivirus researcher, is how could I do it so that people like me would click on it, right? So it was back in 2005. I, w I went to I was invited to ICAR because I did an, uh, a research on how to create a very good phishing. So our thing back then it was it was pretty good, right? It was trying to fool a DNS server into thinking that a, that a given website had a, the wrong IP address. So we would do a request and they would answer really fast the request, trying to trying to beat in the race the real request. So it was just cash poisoning. That was really tough. I mean. We had to be on a LAN, and even on a LAN, we were successful. Guess, guess what percentage of the time? 50, 1%. I was surprised. It was like uh, 10, 15%. So it wasn't too bad on a LAN. If you do it to the, through the internet, that probably goes down to zero point something. So it was unusual, right? You know, so my presentation in ICAR back then, it was like, you cannot reliably do cash poisoning in order for smart people or you know 99 to full 100 percent of the population always almost that was 2005 then 2007 you know what happened somebody beat me to it somebody did something that is really really stupid but is really really smart it's uh the dns uh dns uh changer do you guys remember dns changer who who, who has dealt with dns changer here Lost, right? It was as stupid and as smart as just changing your DNS and controlling the whole connection. So there was no cash poisoning needed. So whenever you were, you were infected, the bad guy would change your 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 DNS server. So something like this. That this is the, the CNN webpage, the real CNN webpage, back in 2009. That's not the yesterday's news. That's pretty old. So whenever you got infected, if you go to the CNN right bookmark or CNN.com you find this. You see the difference, very small difference, right? It was changing double click to, an, to another uh, phony IP. And the IP was serving, instead of the original advertisements that were trying to sell you cars, then they were trying to sell you Viagra or, or something similar to that. So it was, it was a very subtle thing, you know? These guys were operating from, uh, well, we found out that much later, but they were operating from Estonia. So it was quite a, quite a smart move. Instead of changing CNN, they were changing double click and those advertisement sites so that whenever you were being displayed some uh, advertisements to you, instead of using the real advertisements, they were, they were running a whole separate, a whole parallel uh, advertisement network that they were getting money from. So pretty smart. Now, that is the, the, the perfect phishing. And this is what we're seeing today. And this is the story that I'm going to tell today. How there's somebody out there using this very, uh, the very same effect to, uh, in order to, to spoof banks, in order for you, even you guys, or, or anybody who is smart enough to not to click on the, on the wrong link on the bank, to go to yourbank.com and go to the fake bank. So this is the, the way in, it's just regular email. It's not necessary that it that is directed to you. So if, if you're in a cyber cafe and somebody does the, uh, the stupid thing of opening this thing, then the DNS ch server has changed. And then after you, that you are very smart, you go in, you go to mybank.com, and you'll be redirected. So this is the way in. It's just uh, something very, very local. So it's, uh, this is an attack that it's only directed to Switzerland. So it's super directed regionally, so no, no directed to the person. and. Uh, what happens is that it, it uses very Swiss mindset. So it's a, it's a Swiss brand, very well-known uh, Swiss uh, brand. And uh, they, they're telling you that you have an invoice, so open the invoice, it's super interesting for you. So it's, it's uh, an RTF, it's an RTF file. So well, what could be wrong, right? It's, it's a rich text format, it's only text. Now when you open that, it opens, um, some sort of uh, it actually opens a uh, wordpad or whatever you have configured for to see rtfs and then there's uh, something inside it's something that you can't even see but it's actually an uh, i think it's an scr or a cpl something that looks innocuous to somebody who doesn't really know if you double click on it then windows will ask you are you really sure i mean i i'm amazed that people still fall for this because you have to open the email 
open the RTF, open the CPL, and say yes to that. So they really make you jump through hoops, but some people do, right? So once you're infected, you, they just change you. Th a couple of things happen, right? You get uh, installed a, a certificate. In your certificate store, there's a new certificate. It's highlighted there. There's really nothing. I, I, I didn't zoom in because there's nothing interesting there. It's, it's just a certificate. There's nothing else. Apparently signed by VeriSign, uh, protected by semantic or something, so something completely random. You have a new certificate, and the DNS ch server has changed. From then on, what happens is that if you go to the bank, and I, I apologize for putting the the logo of the bank. And I know that banks hate when they're being displayed, but banks here are just victims. They're just pure victims. So it's one bank. I don't even know. So once you go to the bank, you're not going to the bank. You're going to a copy of the bank hosted by the bad guys, right? So it's it's uh, it's a very strange uh, kind of notification that they got there. So normally you wouldn't get this notification. Instead of that, they say, okay, to verify that you are you, you need to install something. Uh, you need to verify. They ask you for username and password, and you would need to verify something on your Android. So they give you a QR code. They give you a download site, so you can they ask you to, to scan it. Remember that this is coming from the bad guy. This is not coming from the bank. The bank is, is just a mirror of server. They don't, e they don't even know that this is happening. So you need to log in. So you have to put your username, your password, and now they're asking you for a verification number that you're supposed to get from Android. It's a two-factor authentication. Remember the story from the bad guy. So you install your Android application, and the Android application, this is Android, it tells you uh, some number, you know, might be time-based. Actually, if you look at the APK, it's just a hard-coded list. There's a very list of number, uh, a very long list of numbers, and they give you one. And then the website, the fake website, it just checks that that number that you have, it's in the list. It's nothing, it's not two-factor authentication. But, uh, in reality, what's happening is that whenever you, whenever you have given everything to the to the bad guy, the bad guy has a username, it has a password, and he has control of your phone. So whenever they send you, whenever the, the bad guy logs in as you, they'll be sent an SMS to you. I mean, to, to the to the victim to verify that they are who they say they are, and they have control of the victim's phone. Therefore, the the SMS will be redirected to the bad guys that the bad guys have. The, the SMS that they need plus username and password, so they can do all banking, all banking operations from from your name, right, from your account. So this is what's happening. They're actually um, as fancy as it, as it looks. You know, two-factor authentication. Some people might be fooled by that. They're just giving away everything they have, and they have complete control of your phone. Now, the scary thing of this whole setup is that the the, the Trojan is actually a Trojan. It's not a bot. Um, it it self destroys. So whenever you you get infected, it just changes your DNS. It just installed a certificate, and it dies away. There's no persistence. It will never rerun. So if at that moment of installation the antivirus has not caught the execution, it never will. It will never have the chance. That executable will never live. So that's scary because uh, as an antivirus company. We see this, and it's like, wow, they don't give us one hour. They don't give us five minutes. They don't give us a minute. If you don't catch it at the time of infection, you don't catch it, period. You have to be looking at DNS to see if, if the DNS is well configured, if it's the original one, if it's the bad one. So it's, it's pretty scary from, from our point of view. You can look at the, um, at the certificate. You can do that if you like. The certificate, mm, you, ca you can be trying to, to catch bad certificates. You could do that, you know, that, that's an option. The certificate might be stolen. I think in this case it was, but I can't, I can't conf confirm. So that was a pretty, pretty scary kind of feeling, you know, because you can't re reliably stop this threat. So what we did next, we checked the attacker's infrastructure to see what was behind. There was a, a variety of domains, a variety of uh, big, pretty big network set up behind. So we have the DNS servers, so whenever they redirect you, 
they redirect it to a bad DNS server, and that's one ball that they're juggling in the air. If this thing falls, the whole thing falls flat. Another one is a server that receives the SMS. Once they have control of your Android uh, of your Android uh, phone, then they have to be redirecting the SMS somewhere, right? Just for them to to enable them to to operate, and uh, that's another ball that they have to juggle in the air. But they have hosting servers, the hosting servers of the APK, and uh, I'll put some examples later, but that's another another thing that if it fails, the whole attack fails. We have the CNC servers. I, I said that it's a Trojan, and that's partially true. The Windows part is a Trojan. The phone part is not a Trojan. The phone part is able to uh, send and receive commands so that uh, th the phones are actually uh, controlled, not controlled, but they, they're able to receive uh, SMS and everything, you to, to, to not to lose control of those, uh, of those phones. Uh, the Android Trojan, the APK, and the Windows Trojan. So that many balls, they're juggling in the air. If one of them falls, the whole thing stops. And that's why we're seeing that these guys, they're, they're creating very short-lived campaigns. Whenever one of these campaigns starts, it stops after a while, uh, like 10 days, 20 days, tops, they stop. Those campaigns stop, and then we see that the DNS goes down and it doesn't work anymore. Why? Because at the end of the day, what the, what the client, what the real victim sees is that they try to log into the bank website and it doesn't work. So at the end, he's going to complain to the, to the bank and tell them, hey, something's wrong with your, with your site, and they will discover the infection, the infection or, or the whole scam. So. Since it's very obvious from the victim's point of view, I think that they have decided that this complicated setup cannot be maintained with very long campaigns. So they're trying to do very short-lived campaigns. Very, very short-lived. And that's madness for us because you can't be looking up at all the whole infrastructure changing in time continuously. It's very difficult for us to get DNS, uh, new DNS servers, they're going up and down constantly. Uh, download sites, the domains that each one of them have. So it's, it's pretty, pretty comp complex from their operations, from their logistics side. These are the domains, for instance. That those are the three, some of the three uh, APKs, uh, APK hosting sites. Uh, there are more, so every APK was customized with the logo of the bank. So there's a multitude of uh, different AP, uh, APK download sites and APKs. And uh, some of them are not really direct uh, related to banks. You, know, you see security.apps.net. Then pivoting off those, we have discovered, we have been able to discover other download sites that are similar, not exactly the same. So the guy who registered the, those is uh, our friend Oleg. So Oleg is probably a fake name, you know. But the next thing we do, it's a pivot. So what has Oleg, fake name, uh, registered to, right? And we see that Oleg has done a lot of very interesting things in the internet, right? We see some Chrome update, some certificate security, obviously fake download sites, not necessarily APK, probably related to other um, update-themed uh, scams. And uh, some other safe browsers, security apps, security apps. So related. Obviously, the, the people behind this uh, are working on the same uh, on the same area, right? Trying to scam in the same way. So this is one uh, uh, one snapshot of if you do an open SSL against uh, the original DNS uh, um, HTTPS server that was serving the, the banking site, that was mm, cloning the banking site, you find that it was posing off this many, like saying, yes, I am this. And uh, you see, this is a particular one against, uh, against Switzerland. So you see the amount of uh, banks from Switzerland, it's, it's pretty high, it's pretty high. Now. It's not only Switzerland, but the, the main country was Switzerland. I don't know if because there's more money in Swiss banks than other people or in other places. I have no idea. There's also Austria. There's also Sweden. And then later on, we discovered that the same attack was being directed against Japan, Japanese banks, lots of them. So this is, uh, this is the early one. So the, this one doesn't have uh, any Japanese bank. But you can see that there's a lot of 
a lot of Swiss banks. That's uh, all that I could see. Um, so sorry about uh, about that. Uh, our Swiss banker friend there will probably not be happy. Sorry. And so looking at the APK, we started looking at the at the APK, and besides all the the routines, the APK had that very string. So that got us puzzled for a while until I got a hold of my Russian friend and uh, one of the guys in my team, Max, he's Russian and he saw that he said like, yeah, that sounds familiar. Apparently that's uh, Russian slang for reset to zero or something like that. So it's some sort of uh, programming comment left over in the code and it's Russian. So can, can some of the Russians in the room verify that that sounds like Russian or might be Russian? Hmm? No? I have no idea how we got it from. Maybe Max is a different kind of Russian. What is it? Okay, so okay. So they don't even know how to write. So we we think it's Russian to the best of our abilities, but there's not a lot more to go on because the as I said, the domains change very often. The DNS or and the IPs behind change very often. So this is the only clue. Now, what we have, uh, and we use pretty often, it's um, we have uh, not hacked, but uh, used some hole in certain websites into the underground so that we were able, for a while until they patched the, the hole, we were able to, to see one particular website, all of the users from the underground that were using that particular site. And uh, so we were able to see all the logs and everything, uh, how they paid. It's, it's a per pay site, so we would see the, the payments, we would see the IPs that the bad guys were connecting from, and we would see uh, other things like binaries they were interested in, URLs they were interested in. So we checked against that website all of the information that we have. And we saw that, yes, sure enough, there was one user in the, in the Russian underground, we think Russian underground, and we saw that the connection IPs. So we look at the connection IPs and most of them, or a lot of them, were from Romania. So we were kind of puzzled, you know, like, okay, it's Russia, is it Romania? We really can't say, it's difficult to say. So it's either a Russian connecting through a Romanian network infrastructure proxy or whatever you want to call it, or perhaps a Romanian in Romania that speaks Russian. No idea, that's our best, uh, our best guess. Other than that, we have no idea who's behind. Uh, we know that they're very persistent, so they keep doing these campaigns. I recently got a hold of uh, w another example. It's pretty much the same, but they have changed their social engineering techniques. Uh, but it, we're talking about the same thing. I mean, it's the same guys that are constantly doing it. They are uh, targeting it regionally, so they're very specific to the countries that they target. They use strategies, social engineering techniques to fool people in, the, in those areas of the world. They use brands that are re really well known to those people, not any other. Um, if you wait to get those emails and you're not in those countries, good luck because you're not going to get any. And uh, they are pretty complex in the, their execution. So the way that they do things they're not just like your regular kind of guy who just does one server and that's it, just one point of failure. Now these guys are able to risk themselves and put a lot of points of failure in their methods to in exchange for very short campaigns, very short-lived campaigns and very dynamic. So they're pretty difficult to get, uh, to get after. And uh, this is, to close, uh, this is the responsible guy of the whole scam that I was talking about earlier, the DNS changer. It took us a very long time to follow him up. Uh, we partnered with the FBI and uh, we finally got him. So he is the one, we're just with uh, flashing his smile there, he's the one responsible for the DNS changer back in 2007. So that was, uh, that was good news for us. Uh, you know, the, the law enforcement is uh, smarting up. They're behind the bad guys and I'm sure with time, if we are as, as persistent as they are attacking, if we are as persistent following up, I'm sure that uh, we'll get there with this one too. And uh, thank you.
think I'm way under time, so we'll pr I probably have time for questions, right? Yeah, hi. So the certificate that you showed had a bunch of emails, email addresses in it as well, such as Gmail, Microsoft, and, and other things like that in, that was in the certificate. The, the server side. That was uh, querying the server. The, the server was posing mm -hmm. as those. Right. But I, I, I'm, did, you hit, did you see anything to do with this bot with maybe using emails to recover, say, reset passwords or anything like that? We did not. No. Okay. Just just used for this banking charge and stuff. Exactly, yeah. In fact, um, some of them, there were domains there that it was uh, posing off correctly, but, uh, but it, they were not in the list. For instance, in the, in the list of banks, um, there's like three or four Japanese banks, and when we realized that, uh, we have a colleague in Japan in, in my department, so he started trying to uh, go to the site and see if, if it was faking other banks related. And some of them were not in the list and they were being correctly being fished. So, yeah. Might be a stupid question, I don't know. Do they use SMS to close the loop from the server to the browser to authorize an operation or to phone home where it will be used later by the, the master of the bot? So when the when the when the uh, normal phone would receive an sms from the bank that was the the two factor authentication or quasi two factor authentication from the bank then uh normally it would send a, an sms back to the to the bad guy so that's a bot right Th that's a bot right so the bot would also accept commands to change that way so instead of sending back an sms it could go to a website and upload it through post to that website. So it, it had both configurations. So we don't know because we have an APK only. And but yeah, it, it's, it was a pretty basic bot, but it was a bot, yeah. Okay, one, two, three. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Magic.